Welcome to the final day of the second annual Carnage Shot International Film Fest. Thank you for joining us for the CSIFS Is Inclusion a Sustainable Movement or a Trend? Nadej Patel will lead the discussion with our panelists, J.R. Roche, Grace Stelt, Setu Jamel Hart, and our festival founder, Mike Lee Coleman Christopher. Ms. Pata is a CSIFS 2022 award jurist. She's an award-winning actor, writer, producer, director, and dancer, recipient of Best Actress of the Year by All-Star Music Awards for her performance on Showtime. Viewers can see her in a reoccurring role on Showtime TV series, City on a Hill. She runs her own production company, MAAT Films, and her produced works have landed distribution with CBS, TBS, ABC, NBC, Comcast, Fox, and more. Thank you. Now moving on to you, Nadej. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. I'm going to first uh, int uh, introduce the panelists, and then we're going to go straight to Q&A. We're going to do our best to optimize the time and hopefully, not Q&A, we're going to go straight to questions with our panelists, and then hopefully uh, we'll have time for Q&A because we'll have a hard stop today. So uh, Magali Coleman Christopher is the founder and director of Conchelle International Film Festival, and we know she's more than that. She's a fabulous actress, director, and writer. Um, we have Grace Felt, who is a Dutch filmmaker from Suriname, descent born and raised in the Netherlands. Rise Up is her first film, but won't be her last. Her main goal is to make people aware of the world's colonial heritage because she believes that when we know better, we do better. Okay, Grace. Now, stay <laughs> tuned, Jamel. Hart is the former CEO of the Will and Jada Smith Foundation, Careers in Entertainment, a premier social impact initiative powered by WJSFF to create more access opportunities and inclusion in the entertainment industry. And J.R. Roche is the owner of J.R. Sterling Productions and also is the executive producer of the award-winning film, Sweet Rhyme. Okay, guys, I'm just gonna jump in and I'm going to start with say to Jamel Hart since this um, a conversation between him and I really was about uh, the impact, and so then it, it, it when Magali and I had a, a discussion, I thought about him because he really engaged and opened my eyes to a lot of things based on his experience in the entertainment as well as politics. So say too. How do you create access and opportunity in an industry that is rooted in the rigid run, white male dominated older generation? Um, I think it's one, acknowledging that fact, uh, first mm -hmm. and foremost, right? And have an understanding that film and entertainment, just like so many other things in our country, in our world, it has been compromised by institutional um, and systemic racism and, and the, how that then impacts, right? And so when we talk about access opportunity and inclusion, we also have to talk about the roots, I believe, of racism, sexism, homophobia, and all of that, if we wanna see narrative change. And then if we don't want to talk about that, right, we can just look at data. I love data and the stats. We know that 90 to 96 percent of the executives who can green light or give access are white men, right? We know that most of the majority of the stories that are being told and put through Hollywood don't look like the faces of us. And yes, there have been tons of gains. There have been tons of um uh, opportunities are being made, but at the core, what we're finding is that both above and below the line, we still need to create more pipeline, we need to create more access, and we create more opportunity. And the last thing I'll say is I'm working on an interesting project right now in Georgia, where everything, which is called the Georgia Film Imperative Project, shout out to the project. Um, and so what we're discovering in Black Hollywood, um, there's no conclusive research where we call Atlanta the new black Hollywood, but there's no conclusive research that when we see the 96,000 jobs that and the $4.4 billion that have been pumped into that economy from a new industry, what we're looking at is how it's affecting BIPOC or black and brown folk more broadly and women in both below and above and the ancillary jobs. What we're not seeing 
is the connect the dot um, moment where it's impacting more broadly local folk in the community in a state that only still has a 515 minimum wage and a seven dollar 25 hour up against the, what the federal government will do so more broadly um the way I come at and, 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 and my allies and my colleagues come at the work is one from a, a, a racial justice, a economic mobility um, framework uh, so that we can also see narrative change, but we can also see, um, quite frankly, more workforce development. Okay. Okay. So is inclusion an apology for the historical lack of diversity? Um, JR, do you think inclusion is an apology for the lack of diversity? Inclusion, of, well, I'm sorry, is inclusion uh, an apology? Yeah, because it's this big thing on this movement of inclusion, inclusion, inclusion. Yes. Is, is it guilt? Is it an apology for 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 the history of not Oh, diversity? okay. I, I think it's uh, partly due to the market forces. Um, we reach a point now where, first of all, the issue of uh, inclusion to me I, is diversity. And it's been proven that diversity makes sense. The mm -hmm. organizations that actually uh, thrive and do best are the ones which are, that are more diverse, which are more diverse. Because with diversity, it brings new ideas, new thoughts. Uh, we're not thinking the same. So it replenishes whatever we're trying to do, right? So with the advent of technology, things are moving. So they're taking a look at the market and seeing, well, traditionally, you have to go this particular route in Hollywood. But technology and what's going on, people say, no, you don't have to do that. So they, they have to recognize that. So they're actually forward looking. They're looking ahead, seeing, well, you know what? This old model doesn't work. It's not sustainable, right? So as I say, you adapt or die, the, uh, the, the, the phrases. So yes, it might look right now like they're trying to throw a bone or make it up. But in fact, they're seeing things that, and we, we know this, that you have to change. You have to adapt. Uh, we now have, um, as I mentioned, it's not one way. You don't have to go to the theater anymore, for example, or the cinemas to watch movies. You don't have to go to the Hollywood studios to actually make it your films made, right? So they recognize that they have to adapt to this model or they have to be inclusive, right? Uh, so this thing is so for, for sustain, uh, sustain, uh, to be sustained, you have to, you have to do this because at the end of the day, that dollar sign actually is what really matters, right? Mm -hmm. So with this, now, if, you're not, if you're not adapting to this, then it, it affects the bottom line eventually or their bottom line. So. Absolutely. Grace, you're a filmmaker. Do you believe in disrupting the norm? If so, why? Do I believe in disrupting the norm? Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, I do. <laughs> um, that is also one of the reasons why I made Rise Up. Um, and why? Well, first of all, I think that in the Netherlands, we are some decades behind where the US is on racism, diversity and inclusion. So in the Netherlands, I think companies are just finding out that diversity works. So we're in that phase. <laughs> and therefore, I would say, yeah, disrupting the norm is a necessity because still in schools, um, we're not being taught anything about colonialism. We're not being taught about the Dutch history in the colonies and everything. So that's, that's we're just starting. And it's 2022. Exactly. Exactly. What's the percentage of blacks who are in the ne Netherlands? I'm, I'm kind of curious. Who? Um, I would guess somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. Okay. And um, still. But that's in the bigger cities. I do have to say, like, there are certain areas probably less than 5 percent. But like Amsterdam and everything, uh, the west side of the country, that would be yeah, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. Okay. okay, what other cultures, though? I mean, overall, people who are melanated, what percentage of the, um, the Amsterdam society 
would be definite defined in America. I don't know what the terminology in Europe is, but defined as people of color. You mean where they come from? Mm -hmm. People, yes. not yes. people from Amsterdam from 500 years ago, but people from places where they are considered people of color when they're in Amsterdam. What percentage of the population is non-Caucasian? I would say in, let's say, Rotterdam, which is also a very big city, it's almost half. I think it's 50, maybe a little more, a little over 50. And in mm -hmm. Amsterdam, I would say close to. Okay. Yes. So, Magali, you started this festival because you saw a need for uh, more, more voices of the Caribbean in terms of does, inclu does inclusion in the Black diaspora include the Caribbean heritage? What are your Can, uh, Does inclusion in the Black diaspora, what? I'm sorry, does I'm inclusion sorry. in terms of the Black diaspora include um, Caribbean content? Uh, I can't speak for the entire Black diaspora because I'm more familiar with the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just a small segment of the Black diaspora. And I would say that um, right now, you are hard pressed to see a lot of Caribbean content in the Black, black American diaspora, but I do know one Haitian American actress who's actually now on a series, I can't remember which of the streaming platforms, and she's playing a Haitian mother, right? And there was a show on, I don't, I, I don't watch, everything on television because there's a million shows. But there was a show, I think it was on Stars, um, of, and there was a Haitian character in the episodic. Um, mm -hmm. How he was developed, I feel, could have been better because there were certain preconceptions that were still in use. But as far as development of new work by Caribbean people telling their own story and trying to develop human beings as opposed to, you know, a drug dealer who happens to have, have enough money to invest into an app who then kills more people to get more money to invest in the app, that kind of a story. I don't really feel that's our story per se, but it's a story that you want to put a Haitian person in because of course Haitians in some people's opinions are good criminals, right? And not anything but that. Um, do I feel repeat the question again because I'm gonna go I'm a riff. I can go on yeah, all day uh, and all night. You know, this, uh, <laughs> we we know we have seen I mean it's already a challenging challenging just for black American stories. Uh, uh, having um, access and opportunities where they say black films are not successful, which we know it's not true o overseas, and this is why they don't invest. Um, so that's already challenging, just black American stories. And there's so much more stories to be told by us that are, that are not getting out there. But then we also have seen there have been uh, pockets of success of just African stories that are having a lot of um, uh, interest in the entertainment industry, but somehow the other diaspora, which is the Caribbean, we haven't seen the Toussaint Louverture who, you know, the success of Haiti. So, <laughs> see, I, have a, I have an issue. I have an issue mm -hmm. with people talking about Nollywood. Cause straight up Nigerians put money into that. Okay. okay, Nollywood is big because Nigerians said we're doing this. Mm -hmm. So when Caribbeans put money into carry wood, we can talk, right? When Caribbeans come together and say, I don't care what your language is, we're going to put this money into this pot and we're going to grow like Nollywood. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what do they call South Americans, uh, uh, the South, uh, South African Hollywood? What do they call it? Sollywood? I don't know what they, what do they call That's it? That's Bollywood. Which no, is there's Bollywood, but then South Africa. And has a massive film industry. What is that called? I, 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 oh. Go ahead. So when we do that, we have something to talk about. I don't want to talk about the man giving me permission. I want to talk about when we put our money where our mouth is, yeah. create the routes of distribution, 
mm-hmm. create create the funding to finance these stories because there are artists out here. I mean, we have 30 films in this film festival. There are artists, okay? People are telling stories. So when the community stops acting as though, oh, you are not Caribbean in my definition, uh, but that person is Caribbean in my definition, when we stop and just say, brother, sister, let's do this. Mm-hmm. When we do that, then we have something to talk about. Because I don't like talking about the man giving me permission because quite frankly, I popped out of my mom's uterus and I hit the land and I've been with God giving me permission. So whenever people talk about the man giving me permission, it's like you forgot that God is unlimited. What are you doing? What are you doing? Okay. You're you're, you're enslaving yourself. I'm not going to hear people enslaving themselves. Yeah. An artist is an artist is an artist. (laughs) Tell your story. All right. Yeah. If you want to have commercial success, then you're saying to someone, you define my art form. If you want to be an artist that reaches people, I'm quoting. See, I'm hearing so much gold from our artists here. If you want to be an artist, be an artist and your audience will come. If Tyler Perry was waiting for someone to give him permission, he would not be a multimillionaire right now. So let's stop <laughs> looking for permission and do it. Amen. Mm-hmm. Say I too, get really passionate. Learning. I get really passionate. I can't be all kind of chilled out about this conversation. <laughs> okay. I just cannot. I, I attend so many events listening to the same give me permission, you know, theme. And I'm like, why? Well, the problem is, is we're not so, together yet to come collectively. But we're going to gonna be, pull our we're going to be, just think, do it. I, I think. Um, <laughs> exactly. But how many people in the entertainment in- industry that you know, who are millionaires, who are billionaires, and reinvesting is very challenging. And I'm going to take it from Say Two, who's been burning to say something. Well, he's worked, he's worked for a, 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 a powerful couple who who even created this non nonprofit that he was the CEO of to create inclusion. But we know it, it has to be more than just these two individuals or other mm-hmm. ones who are billionaires and millionaires. Go ahead, Say Two. You've been burning so- to say. Well, I just wanted to add um, what I love about inclusivity is that true inclusivity is what we just saw, right? It's everybody's kind of context of opinion. And so I'm a very, how I have been really blessed in a way to come at this work is to come at it with really understanding and having the frame again and the nuance of Um, institutionalization across the board. So if we're talking about Nollywood versus Caribbean or even what's going on in South Africa, we also have to understand what economies of scale have been able to do in those countries, right? So if we're talking about why the Caribbean has it, they're a combination of, quite frankly, and I don't mean this in a disparaging way, of poor nations who are still ruled by a certain colonial construct. That doesn't mean there's not money there to organize, but when we're talking about Nigeria, we're talking about South Africa, there are being economies of scale over time that have lived off and basically imprisoned people again who look like us. So then narratives and things like that are going to be reflective, right? So part of the work um, that I continue to do um, with some other people is how do we get at some of the roots that are deconstructing all of us in certain ways as it relates to economy access to wealth, access to money, and really coming at it that way and around when we're talking about narrative. We know that in Hollywood, 80% of the films we see, right, come out of uh, Hollywood. But Hollywood is not reflective of 80% of the population of the world. And I think, I, I forget who was saying this, we also have to think about inclusivity and the impacts that um, racism and the racial wealth gap have had on all of us. Mm -hmm. So that to the point about how do we support our own films and institutions? I'm always having this conversation where people say, there are no black, there are no great black films. And I'm like, why don't you Google independent film festivals such as this the content and so sometimes the onus for me is uh, uh multifold some of it's on us how do we find filmmakers and go to their premieres and support like i'm fascinated already with what grace is talking about with rise up right you know so like um so how are we finding those films how do we support them both individually and collectively um and i think some of that 
uh, is connected to creating this film and entertainment industry that is more broad, that is um, less about status, and, and becoming a star or being in the mainstream, but really about at the core where it started from, storytelling. And mm -hmm. I think healing and mm -hmm. um, bringing about coalitions and showing our differences and not being stereotypical. And so I actually think that film, when we're at our core, um, gives us the opportunity to bring about a lot of healing and in the midst of difference, create more understanding and conversation. And one of the things that I think that, you know, um, we did well at Careers Entertainment was we were very focused for right or for wrong on how the grassroots and the grass tops meet so that everybody can get access and opportunity and inclusion. Because what my former employers know the best is that the opportunity changed their lives and then they've dedicated their resources believe it or not to really impacting people who are close to them and what we often call our chosen family um amen and i love the fact that you included healing because i i i hear your passion magdalene and i 100 agree but we have to get to the root of healing right because that which creates the problem of the, that you say the dependency, right? The dependency of give the handout instead of saying, I'm going to do it myself. We first have to, we have first have to recognize where, where is it that I need to heal to think that I have to wait and, 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 and wait for the great white hope when, when it's within me, right? Because remember, it's, it, we have been indoctrinated in this thing. You have, to, you have to be honest with yourself and see where are you affected? I would say indoctrinated and separated. And separated. If we don't because do that, how are we going to move forward? Go ahead. Exactly. Go ahead we are so close to, for example, France, but I don't know anything about French colonial history. I don't know anything that we have in common. The other day, Friday, I was talking to some of oh, the other wait. filmmakers, <laughs> and he's from Barbados, I think. Mm -hmm. And he told me about some of the issues that, that are um, that are going on within that community. And they were similar to what I see in Suriname. And they are similar to what I see in Curaçao, but we don't know about each other. There's at least, I think, Places, uh, places like this, they are important for us to meet and for us to recognize like, oh my God, we are, we are one. Yeah. JR, you yeah, you are. JR, okay. you want to say something. I'm, I'm gonna throw a curveball in here. Um, support to what Magali was saying earlier. Okay, so in my opinion, the issues of infrastructure uh, and so forth in regards to the Caribbean film development, right? Mm -hmm. If we look at music, our music is worldwide selling in the billions, right? So mm -hmm. we make music for the world and people consume that music. Because the music industry, especially in Jamaica, the infrastructure is excellent. We spend time developing music as a product. Film, recorded film, the industry at this point is still a bit scattered. So we need to have somehow create a, some kind of a former system. I'm sure. The same thing happened in, in, in Nigeria, right? They have a system um, for funding, artist development, channels, and so forth. It's already established. In the Caribbean, we grew up, for example, in Jamaica, we do a lot of stage performances. So our plays sell out. So we have a play that we write. It goes on tour. It sells out everywhere. They're double, they're, they have, sometimes have to book with double, you know, repeat show because it's tickets are sold out. So I'm saying there's an audience for it. Mm -hmm. If we produce stuff with great quality content, right? Somehow the market will come. You look at some movies, Jamaica wrote a movie, I think uh, The Harder They Come, that was written in the seventies, a cult classic. You go to Austin, Texas, you see Jimmy Cliff's uh, mural on a wall. So I'm saying if we create or develop the industry more locally and you know, pay attention to the content and quality and so forth. People will come. Just like they come for music. I mean, the world didn't shut the music industry. So 
if it's really a thing where I believe people are holding us down, then our music wouldn't, wouldn't be selling. It wouldn't be influencing cultures globally. And we are doing that because we're actually great at it. We spent years and years with the steel pans in Trinidad, whatever, in the, in the labs in Jamaica, we, we create it and the world loves it. So we can do the same for music, right? But we got to think sometimes when we write, not only write necessarily about the same things, same mm -hmm. themes. We have to push ourselves and write different stories, full stories, all of our stories, right? Mm -hmm. It's not all trying, and we're not all quote, quote unquote ex slaves. We have beautiful traditions of love and whatever. We're not all, you know what I'm saying? So get out of the stereotypical writing and development, spend time developing the crap and the infrastructure and the whole infrastructure, which would need, in some instances, maybe government supports and more collaborative efforts among the diaspora. Because we speak the same language, ironically. We speak, whether it's, it doesn't matter the, uh, the tongue, the language is the same, the history is the same. We like the same rhythm, the same music, the same thing. We're the same people. And I know that because I've traveled the Caribbean, and that, that's what actually, actually inspired my, 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 my previous work. Having gone to Suriname and different places, seeing that, well, we speak a different language, but the history is the same, same people. So it's more, it's more of a, to me, it's more of a structural and content thing um, because we're doing it, we're excelling in other areas. And I, it's just my, my view of it. It's maybe controversial, but go ahead. I have two points. One, can we erase the word inclusion and make it infusion? <laughs> infusion. Can we do that? Second point, it's also the audience saying yes to different styles of storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. The audience not saying, but that's not familiar, and then walking away is a problem. So we can't just tell our artists, do this, do that, because we're making work for you, right? So the same way people were able to embrace Black Panther, even though they never saw a Black sci-fi, although there's been tons, the same way people embrace the people of color and people not of color embraced it, we have to be able to, to, to embrace experimental films, all right? We embrace the horror film genre, and we never really had that embrace. But of course, Mr. Peel, Jordan Peel, is now blowing up horror in the black community and horror, 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 horror. But when he first said, I'm going to do a horror, do you think people said, nah? Of course people said, nah. Right? I couldn't watch it because I don't like horror films, but I had to watch it because the black man wrote and directed it. So I did what I have to do. And I haven't watched the second film, but you know, I'm slow with horror. But the point is, it, I, it was an amazing conversation between Gabri, Krista, and Mayala Cancel this morning. There was an interview for Karu Karamo podcast. And she was saying, you know, we as artists, we have to own that we're artists. We're not robots, but then we have to ask a, 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 our community to say yes to our art form and don't be conservative because the Caribbean community can be conservative. Then, And they're even conservative with the music, right? It took forever for Zook to become hot, but now it's hot, right? There's the way that a song should be. And then you go, no, nudge it. And then you, and you say, oh, you young people, what are you doing? Right? When dance hall came out, how many Jamaican people said, mm, that's not good. And then, of course, they're like, dance hall is Jamaican music. So allow ourselves to be resisted and push through the resistance by continually producing the work until people say, okay, whatever, cool. So I, think, I love... Go ahead, go ahead. So um, I, I, I'm sorry. I just, I love, right? And so I love everything that I'm hearing. And I keep coming back to how connected this is to the deconstruction of tropes that have been racist, Right. So even when we're talking about creative, the impact of racism across the world to anybody who looks or people of color are, are have have had disabling effects and impacts on everything we think about doing. Film as a sector is not like magically decompartmentalized from the impacts and effects of what is institutionalized racism, structural racism, and colonialism, and then therefore the economic impact. So when we talk about Nollywood, right, in Nigeria, both the Nigerians, both in pre and post Nigeria under rule, made different decisions to invest 
in film, kind of like what we're talking about. Even um, in the diaspora, where it's talking about music and all that, and I agree, right? We have to also make commitments to film, to a variety of ways of storytelling. Actually, I think there's opportunity in places um, like the Caribbean differently than places sometimes like in uh, America, because depending on what we do when we go to places here in the States to like Atlanta or Georgia, right? No one wants to talk about this. We have to have um, clear guidelines. Are we going into those states because they have low wages? So as we do create and more tax incentives and all of that so the film industry can come in, are we doing them at a baseline to create a standard of living for the majority of black and brown folk who, while it's great to make a film, it's great to tell our stories, but are we also making sure that we're not contributing to a continued system of what is indentured servitude, what is right from both above and below line? We can't access whether you want to have a debate about union access or whether you want to have a debate about um private filmmaking, if you will, for lack of a better term, I know there's another term. The the baseline is we can't often get into either. And when we do get in, right, in Georgia, most of the folk I see that are getting jobs sometimes um, are being, secu- who are local, are $10 an hour security guards, right? And I'm saying that very broadly, right? But even the actors, the SAG actors, people in SAG, there are lower rates in these cities and states. And again, who are predominantly, um, uh, who are the predominant uh, uh, citizens, right? So I think it's really having these conversations and going deep and saying, hey, I think we have to disrupt this system in a way that is not antagonistic, but it's really about equity, right? And I do use the word healing a lot because economics can bring about a certain level of of healing and robustness because it creates in a capitalistic society an opportunity for us to have all to have a different um, quality of life. And I personally believe, and I've seen it, how the film industry through the jobs, you can almost take any job from plumber to writer and create it and it's playing itself some way on a film set and in production. And so the onus is that for me, how do we make this a workforce initiative? How do we make it a storytelling initiative? How do we make it an economic mobility initiative and really challenge the system? Um, I love um, how you said the word infusion, to infuse because if we don't create an actual infusion if the, I always tell people, if the racial wealth gap is 228 years, they didn't live that long in the Bible days, right? <laughs> so if we won't see, uh, if we don't infuse, we won't see any change in that gap. And that's data. I always say it's not even say two talking. That's just the data that we can all access that's saying that. So um, long-winded way. I'm saying that I think that everything we're saying, I think it's that nuance, right? It's pieces and slivers of everything we say that need to live out to create this idea. I'm I'm totally still in infusion to um, infuse change, both in many ways of my buckets. I live in three buckets in the film industry. How are we impacting below the line? How are we impacting above the line? And how are we impacting and making change and an infusing, I'm using now, and infusing in what I call the ancillary jobs and the ancillary markets that are also feeder, feeders into this industry? Because what we're seeing more broadly is uh, we talk a lot about above the line, but what we're not seeing enough is how it's becoming a natural part of folks um, lives if they so choose. There is a question from Ava Maria. Can you read that, Magali? I can read it. It says, exactly, infusion. With but say two, she has a question for say two. But say two, do you think we're in a position to create our own econ- economy as Black people, some of those who dish out the racism? <laughs> as Magali has been saying, be an artist, don't ask for permission. Um, I think I love that sans um the sans sans those who did out the racism. That's a real thing. Um I think we're in a position to create whatever we want if we are start building like-mindedness and mindful. So differently said, if 
the five, I don't think it has, I think movements, right? Let's just talk about movement building. Movements in this country have been started um, by small groups of folks to get impact, right? We use the example of dance a lot. So I think, yes, but I think um, that we have to be clear on what some of our goals are and what we're going for and that we can't accomplish it all. Not to keep talking about my project in Atlanta, but the my the goal of the work in Georgia is not just about getting more black folk to work in the film, but the underlining goal is how are we having more broader conversations about raising the minimum wage? I was just with the Secretary of Labor and I said, he said, if you could if I could give one message say to to bring Brad to President Biden, I was like, well, my one message would be not just the federal laws, but how are we moving Congress to at least have a baseline of a fifteen million, a fifteen million, a fifteen dollar minimum wage, which, right, for an economy of scale and where this economy is, we're still seven to eight dollars about behind what a quality of life, a livable working wage looks like of twenty three dollars an hour, right, baseline across the country, and so. Um, I think we can do that as black folk, but I also believe after seeing in all of this, how are we building coalition and allyship? Because the onus on creating more economic mobility and equality should not just be on black folk or our Latin folk or the folk who have traditionally in this country done the work to move the needle for anyone of marginalization to um uh to benefit so i also think who gonna come in here how you talking to your cousins how you um holding in and saying um you're walking and marching with us in a modern way and i'm using walking and marching um figuratively um to make change and to infuse um these differences in this industry because you know someone once famously said and i think it's also understanding that power concedes nothing without a fight. So mm. if you think that we're going to just keep saying, oh, I think we should do these things, and we're not, and, and as Dr. King said, we can have power and we can have love. They're not mutually exclusive. And so if we're moving towards that with power and love, but understanding that it's not going to concede nothing without a fight, I think I, I, asked her, I, I hypothesize that we can't actually put some cracks in that ceiling. Um, but I do think it's a collective and really doing things like this and being authentic and unabashed and unapologetic that we need to infuse. Mm, I think JR, you wanted to say something. Yes, JR is like, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> come on in, JR. So uh, we have like, Two minutes, people. <laughs> we okay. have an amazing oh. screening following this. And I oh. just like a conversation that takes 5,000 years. But I know. We just got two minutes, and I hate to be the one to yell at right, so it. Let's wrap it up this way. Um, JR, yeah. I need to hear what you have to say. Okay. I'm okay. so aching. I'm aching. Okay. I'm aching. As a creator, as a creator who wants to hire people that looks like me, right? It's important that I have people who are committed to the process, right? Mm -hmm. Who show up on, show up and do the work. Sometimes maybe work a little bit, work for a little bit less sometimes because we're struggling filmmakers trying to get things off the ground. So as an independent uh, filmmaker, yes, you want, you know, great people, but sometimes the cost is an issue as well, right? And we might not be in a position to pay the very high, high wages, but oftentimes not, you, you won't find a lot of people who are willing to uh, work for less or work for, Mm -hmm. Try to accommodate you, right? So remember, at the end of the day, there's some cost issues. As, as filmmakers, issues of cost <laughs> raises their heads all the time, right? So how do you um, include and, and keep your costs down, which is which is a reality, you know, unfortunately. So let me just say this really quickly. When I'm talking about economies of scale, I'm talking mm -hmm. about economies of scale. I am the first person to understand budgets and recognize what film is, right? But mm -hmm. the fact that in the, and so one, we need to build pipeline better. That's the other mm -hmm. thing that we're doing and put people in positions to get these trainings and these jobs and even to create more and more funds, right? But what I'm not, and then we have to challenge ourselves, right? Are you then willing to do some trade-offs of the helping 
bring in folk who you're going to also, while you're going to maybe pay them a lower wage? Are you going to help them build? What are, what are they getting other than yeah. as the creative helping yeah. you get your film distributed? And I think that's where we all, because we're all, our minds have been constructed to how a film industry is supposed to work. Who created that? Some random white person, no, generally speaking, and now that's the bar. Change the bar. It, and so it becomes different <laughs> and more bespoke when we're willing to be that brave. So change the bar. But what we don't get to change, right, is indentured servitude and slavery. Mm. Because the same person might be needing more money because they had to catch the bus to come do the film. So that's why they're late. It's not always because people are lazy or people are this. Mm -hmm. You have to understand why people, like, they want these opportunities. So we have to change the bar. We have to infuse broadly. Oh, God, so we can go on forever. So let's 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 wrap it up with this one. Cause say too, I know you're doing some powerful work because you're doing the whole political in the entertainment and and trying to dis dis disconstruct. I mean, break down the whole um, inclusion thing. And now we got from my lead infusion, right? Infusion. So infuse. Let's, and I, 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 I have always said inclusion is an illusion, right? So infusion have, is part of our mission. Inclusion is an illusion. That's I've, I've always kept that because I'm like it's not it's not inclusion. Yeah. It's an illusion. So one word that describes who you are and not not what you are. We know what you've accomplished, everyone. But one word that describes who are you, and we'll wrap it up from there. God inspired. Or it could be a phrase. She said God. It could be a phrase. It doesn't have to be one word. God so inspired. Said, Ancestor inspired. That's my phrase. She's God inspired. God inspired and ancestor inspired because I feel my ancestors <laughs> working through me. So I'm going to say ancestor inspired as well. Okay, JR. Think outside the box and disrupt. Grace. Um, a healer. Okay. Say two. Grateful. Grateful. Love it. Love it. Thank you guys. This has been so informative. And I've always, my the way I refer to myself is a creative light in motion, you know, bringing light, helping people to transform the darkness by learning how to turn on the light. Right. And that's what we do as artists. We're healers where we disrupt, we disrupt the norm and help people think a different way. We inspire Thank you so much for your beautiful energy. For and Ilani is going to close us out with telling yes. us what's happening next, or I will do it, whichever one works. Let's see what happens. Okay, I will do it because maybe Ilani's away from my computer. Next, we have the live screening of Devotion, written directed by Don Wilkinson. It's going to be in the Hibiscus live screening room in fourteen minutes. So. Don't leave, hang out in the hangout zone and come out in the, into the live screening room. And thank you so much. Okay, I got heated, but thank this you. was juicy. <laughs> you okay, come thank back you. to the after party. Thank you. Yell some more and stamp my feet. Okay, bye. It's okay. Thank you guys. It's good to get juicy. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> thank you guys.